purpose of Free Thought Forum is to be vigilant to the encroachment of religion into government and to educate the general public as to what a free thinker is. My thoughts give me power. No scholar can map them. No hunter can trap them. No person can deny. No person can deny. Hello and welcome to Free Thought Forum. I'm Catherine Farringer, the producer of this show and your host for this program. With me today is Dr. Ronald Ribble. And the subject that he's going to discuss is a psychology of religious belief. Welcome to the show, Ron. It's so nice of you to come. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. So I'm going to, uh, since I'm not a psychologist, I'm going to have to ask you all kinds of questions about it. I hope I'm intelligent enough to ask questions. I found, you know, you need to, it's hard to ask the right questions if you're not smart enough. And I may not be smart enough for a psychologist. So what did you, uh, this is, um, it has to do with why we have, we believe, why we believe in some well, supernatural something, the big well, daddy in the sky. Precisely, and what we want to talk about today is, is why we as people either believe or do not believe in a supreme being. Not so much whether there is one or isn't one, that's yeah, another issue that's, entirely, yeah. but, but what is the need, what is the motivation for us, what impels us, what drags us or pulls us to believe in a God. Um, and um, we're, we're going to go uh, through a lifespan um, development of, of this belief and what form God takes for us, not in all cases, but in many mm -hmm. cases, as we proceed from life, for, from birth to, to death, you know. Um, so as a child, uh, a vulnerable child with a nice unwritten on a slate, as it were, a brain that hasn't been warped and twisted. What is, would, would, why, who thought it up in the first place? I mean, if you didn't have somebody impressing beliefs on you mm -hmm. or imposing their ideas mm -hmm. on you, would you tend to have to have something? Well, what we have is theories about how the notion of God arises, and some would say that God is a, the belief in God and God are a product of our upbringing and our rearing, of course, some, as you say, somebody impressing mm -hmm. the belief on you. And others would say, like Carl Jung, that, that there is built in each of us the idea of God. We are born with the, a notion, a kernel of, mm. of, of knowledge or of the existence of something called a supreme being, and that prompts uh, certain things in our life, like archetypical symbols in our dreams that supposedly represent God, that, that, that wherever man is, there is this notion of God, a supreme maker, a supreme being. Hmm. That's that's one theoretical uh, viewpoint. Well, um, I I think sometimes I feel a, a great affinity with uh, with nature, with the universe, with mm -hmm. with things. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I'm so carried away by a brilliant sunset or something that I almost feel like I'm throwing myself into the middle of it. I'm just so carried away. I suppose that could be called some kind of uh, religious experience. Yes, mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. But I don't ever personalize it. I mean, it's mm -hmm. never something that is a big guy or mm -hmm. it's a, a being. Mm -hmm. It is, um, since isn't it a line that we all made of the stuff of the stars? Uh, so when you know that's that's something i want to bring up too because nobody ever seems to worry about where they were before they were born but they always worry a lot about where they're going when they die which i find rather curious i mean if we're talking about eternity right mm -hmm. uh, so if, sure. so uh, how come they don't think about that well we, we don't worry about that let's let's go to childhood and say well, you know when we're first born we're, we're not yeah. worried about where we're going know, we're, we're worried high. about where we're at <laughs> Mm -hmm. You know, as Mr. Freud said, at that time of our life when we were born, we have, we have a kernel of personality. It's called the id. 
and that mm -hmm. it is full of our impulses and our needs and it, it drives us to want to get fed when we feel like getting fed and and doing something in our diapers when we want to do something in our diapers you know it's kind of like I want to do it I need it now give it to me mm -hmm. and and we have great needs when we're a child we're the most helpless animals on the face of the earth a newborn human infant and those needs are met in in most of our cases by our parents and from a motivational standpoint when we talk about why we believe in God our need, our, our belief in God arises from our needs. And so in our early childhood, in our infancy, our needs are pretty basic. We need to be fed. We need to be touched. We need to feel warm and loved. And we look to our parents to do that. And for a considerable portion of our early childhood, our parents are essentially our gods. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, and I always like, when I talk with my classes about this, as, as we were mentioning earlier, um, if you look, if you think back when you were a child, how warm and comfortable and safe and secure you felt yes. in the presence of your parents. Parents could protect you essentially from anything. Mm -hmm. So in a, in a sense, our parents were the omnipotent figures in our life. Besides, at that time in our lives, we have a very difficult time conceptualizing anything or anyone that doesn't present themselves to us concretely. Yeah, well, I like that idea myself. I yeah. mean, that's why I get Well, that's a, little... a, that's a rationalist <laughs> viewpoint, right? <laughs> I want it there where I can touch it or go to lunch with it or do something that I know. <laughs> Some of us are, cre are, are more, are more right-brained, if you will, though, yeah. and say, well, that's fine. I like to think about things that, yeah. that never have been and maybe never were or never will be. <laughs> Uh, you I know, think I, about them, but I puzzle about them a lot. I <laughs> well, uh, so that uh, there are two ways then that that maybe well, I, do I have that too? That that need that I that I would have to make something up about a God. Well, it, it doesn't I, necessarily mean that you end up with the idea of God later on. First of yeah. all, our needs evolve as as we grow older. Our, our needs when we're an infant and a young child are basically those of uh, survival and safety and security and, and being loved, being cared for. And, and as, as we mature, as we develop, and as we begin to realize, for instance, that our parents are not the omnipotent folks that we thought they were. Yeah. When did you discover? I, I think uh, I was about 13 when it I differs for some. It, 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 it differs for some. It depends on when we first begin to realize we're manipulating them, uh -huh. amongst other things. <laughs> and we do the, some of us don't now. Some of us live in very austere and rigid family structures called authoritarian structures mm -hmm. and we are taught from uh, the earliest times when we are first able to comprehend that we must always respect and obey authority figures and there's a fairly sizable segment of our community that's raised in that kind of a household and uh, uh, they, mm -hmm. they are shall we say uh, taught from the very beginning about the fear of God Yes. Uh, without regard to what what you end up believing, you know, you're you you are given you are put in the fear of God from the very earliest times. Um, when do you first learn that it? You know, it varies for different people, but when you do learn that your parents are mm -hmm. no longer the omnipotent figures in your life, and you still have these same needs to be protected and fed and the great uncertainties of the future, you're getting on towards adolescence now, and you begin to realize for the first time in your life that death is not a game, it's not going bye-bye, it's not something you can come back from like the coyote does in the Roadrunner and the Coyote, mm -hmm. you know, that there is a finality here which you can begin to conceptualize, and it's an uncertain finality, you begin to get afraid of that. And so now we have this fear of death coming on, with growing knowledge of the world, uh, growing understanding of, of, the, of the humanness of our parents, their weakness, their limitations, that, that we share that and that life doesn't go on forever and what's beyond there and who's going to save us from that end. And so fear of death a, a realization that there is no immortality for us may then create a drive or a motivation to believe 
in someone or something that can provide that for us. Well, do you think some people, though, um, want that desperately, but that they do still have a problem really believing? Do you well, sure, there's a lot of other motives and needs in our lives that, that create those problems. For instance, if, if you start talking about, you know, as we're going over into adolescence, when, when we're beginning to develop our own self-identity, and when we're beginning to uh, establish ourselves as individuals and decide what it is that we stand for in life and where we're going. And we have this thing that Freud called the libido. And that's the kind of the storehouse of all our energies that goes into our impulses, like we're becoming sexual animals and mm. we'd like to try that out. Mm. And on one hand, we have this very strong desire to do all these things our impulses are leading us to do. On the other hand, we have somebody telling us, but there is a God or there is a rule or there is a law that says we should not engage in such behaviors. Mm -hmm. And so here, depending on what kind of family the child is in, and what their own nature and personality is like, they have to make a choice between conflicting demands and conflicting needs and decide, what am I going to believe in? Sometimes believing in God is a convenient thing, and sometimes be not believing in God is a convenient thing. Well, what about, I'm going back to these children. You, know, you said mm -hmm. the first gods we have are our parents. Mm -hmm. Okay, but what if you have abusive parents? Mm -hmm. Is that then would you translate that into an abusive God? Possibly. Possibly that kind of translation could be made. I think the remarkable thing when you would bring up abusive parents is that in my experience as a psychologist in dealing with people mm -hmm. in, at a clinical level, no matter what our parents have ever done to us in our early life, no matter how abusive or rotten they have ever yeah. been to us, children on and on through their life, even into their adulthood, still look back, want to revere their parents, and wish there was some way that they could have changed all that, and frequently live around their parents and are still trying to make yes, their parents into I'm, loving, caring mm -hmm, creatures. I know, and, and, and it's hopeless mm -hmm. if they don't have that, uh, the warmth and the, mm -hmm. that, that quality mm -hmm. of good, good parents should have. Uh, you'll never change them. But I know, I've, I realize, I've read about people who, that was their one desire to say something finally that would make their parents say, gosh, you're a great mm -hmm. kid, or really loosen up and, and get a little praise or love or something, mm -hmm. and they never did, but they still just kept trailing along and just hoping and hoping and hoping. That's a sad situation. You'll like it? my answer to that when I yes. see somebody like that in the clinic. Yeah, I tell them, tell them, it's nice if we can get our mom and dad to be different than they are, but just remember that your worth doesn't come from the way they treated you or, mm -hmm. or what they thought of you. Your worth is whatever you think it is. And so what we have to work on is how you feel about yeah, yourself. It's a That's a very family. humanist yeah. uh, approach to, you know. Well, it is, and it should. I mean, you'd really, it's depending on that umbilical cord that really isn't there uh -huh. is kind of uh, folly. So you might just as well say, well, I wish, I wish, mm -hmm. I wish a lot of things mm -hmm. that aren't going to come true. <laughs> that isn't, I haven't had any problem with the parent thing, but uh, other things. But wishing is not going to make it so. So you might as well just say, I'll pack that up. That's just a little fun dream box I have to entertain myself with occasionally. But I have to face what I have to face and get on with it. Yeah. So um, we, we go on God quietuses. Uh, sometimes in our adolescence. Uh, adolescence, by the way, today we psychologists define it as extending into the latter 20s, by the way. Oh, uh, I'd say. Meaning, I've... You know, if, if you define adolescence by when we finally break free and stand on our own two feet, it's getting later and later I was in Western say, society. I know, I know people in their <laughs> 60s that I'm not. <laughs> well, yeah, emotionally. Uh, we, we, we have to give it some more finite definition. Yeah, I mean, otherwise. We can manage. So, so we say late 20s. I've uh -huh. seen them go far beyond that. Yeah. Uh, but we, we have a, that's a period of time when we have a God quietus, e even if somebody ultimately ends up believing in God and, yeah. and fervently. So this is a period of time when we're experimenting with life. Yeah. And this is when God can be a very inconvenient thing, particularly when we're experimenting with our sexuality and with drugs and things like that. You know, we don't need this heavy hammer yeah. hanging over our head all the time saying, don't, 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 don't. Uh -huh. uh, so, uh, you know, I can recall at that period of time, I was not 
Uh, I was religious in the sense that I believed in a supreme being, but I didn't go to church much. And I think I didn't mm-hmm. want to be reminded very much of what was right and wrong at that point in, yeah. in my life. And I think a lot of young people are like that uh, during that adolescent stage. Well, I can remember when I was about 13, I guess, I said to my best friend, I think I'm an atheist. Well, I, at that time I said it, I was saying it more or less for maybe shock value or <laughs> or rebelliousness or something against the way I'd been reared, which was not overly, you know, drastically religious. It was, I was an Episcopalian and that's kind of laid back. But, uh, the, I, when I, after I said it, it was really funny. Something happened. I think it was almost as if I were foretelling the future. Uh, because that was, um, when I said it, I, I almost realized that I had come face to face with a truth. And uh, although I had started out just to be a, a shock you, you value. You just stated what was, what was right here. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And, uh huh. And it was it's kind of surprise shock value. I guess I was well, it was shocked rather than, <laughs> than my friend. <laughs> well, what else can you tell me about early childhood gods? Just parents. Well, I, I think we, 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 we've really gotten up there into adolescence. I mean, our, our early gods are our parents and they're born of very basic needs. And once uh, we begin to realize that our parents are not all that omnipotent, we, we begin to look other places for mm-hmm. someone to provide us with these very special uh, things that we need in our life. And, and by the time we become adults, our needs change somewhat. We are looking for immortality in a variety of ways. Uh, my, maybe not through a god, maybe through whatever it is that we accomplish in our life. That's another form of immortality, mm-hmm. leaving something behind, building monuments. People in their 50s frequently are in the monu- in the review of monuments, the review of life, mm. the, the scattered, I have analyzed life and it's all scattered around my feet and I'm yeah, trying to wonder what it's been about. Mm. Uh, so we, we, we have a need for knowing what the meaning of life has been and sometimes we find that in a God, in a belief in a God. And then I think the one that really interests me, the need that the adult need that really interests me is the need for empowerment. Mm. The need for right. an empowerment by, uh, say, an unassailable source. I mean, there's nothing in this world, it's a very earthly thing in a way, of, of aligning yourself with, of identifying with and associating with very powerful other people. Mm-hmm. A certain amount of a power accrues to you from that, and and certainly what could uh, provide one greater empowerment than association with and a, de- a strong identification with a god? Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. Well, it certainly seems to work very well, doesn't it? Because well, sure. Uh, they certainly the believers are the ones who get all the respect. As long as you are genuflecting and bowing all over the place, you're just uh, one of the accepted ones. Well, you have to believe in the right things, depending on who, who you're yeah, talking so they to. They keep marrying uh, morals to religion, and of course the religion has a rather sordid background. Um, is it is it religion that has sorted background, or is it the people who who profess to believe yeah, it? Yeah, well, sort of background? yes, <laughs> indeed. I mean, who made it up in the first place and started laying down the rules? So, <clears throat> well, I I think that um, uh, some uh, people uh, believe and belong to religious groups that espouse very palatable, uh, very warm uh, and endearing ideas and, and things that one can say, okay, that's all right. But um, it's kind of like, I think it was Bertrand Russell who said if anybody ever tried Christianity, be a good, it would be it might be a good thing. Yeah. Uh, and, but, and, and what he's really saying is that most people who most loudly speak and profess a belief in and uh, thump yeah. on their board or on their chest or on their microphone are are those who don't really live it, who live contradictions mm-hmm. more than they do what it is they profess to believe. And um, well, there's that's a, because that, that too stems from needs in their life though. Motivations in our life. There's a new book, I don't know whether I've mentioned to you, that's out that, that might be of some interest. It's called 
When God Becomes a Drug. And it's written by an Anglican priest by the name of Leo Booth. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. And finally, after a car crash, he realized he had to get hold of himself and do something. So he went, he went through the 12-step program, which mm -hmm. when he did that, then he started looking at people's behavior. And he realized that there are all kinds of addictions, not just alcohol. Uh, there, of course, we have the people who are... Um, gamblers that mm -hmm. can't stop and uh, we have the food problems, mm -hmm. the bulimia and uh, so, but he found that the, one of the worst ones was a religious addiction mm -hmm. and he addresses that very interestingly. Mm -hmm. I, I think you might enjoy looking through it. Now he, of course, he has come to discard his old God which was the one that you never questioned and you never uh, mm -hmm. had that that uh, relationship with. And now he's got what I guess he calls the real God. It's kind of amusing to someone like me to read that sort of thing, but I, I'm very sympathetic towards what he's done because that was my first step, I think, was the organized religion part went. I kept God mm -hmm. for a while. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was so as you couldn't see him anyway, so it just is okay. But this organized religion stuff, I, I didn't like what I saw, mm -hmm. the hypocrisy and all. Mm -hmm. So he's gone through something like that. And I think you would, you, you do work with uh, addictive uh, people, don't you? Oh, yes, lot? yes. Uh -huh. so, and as a matter of fact, I'm, uh, we're, we're, we're trying to uh, get the an alternative program to the 12-step program uh, started here in town. Mm -hmm. How's it and, going? Uh, well, we're, we're making fledgling steps, and we do have an agreement with uh, one of the hospitals here to uh, provide a service right on the unit, alternative to the 12 steps, and they're providing a space to uh, have the meetings as oh, a result, uh, weekly meetings. And uh, I think it'll fly after a while, but we, it, we're we going against tradition with this. This oh. is a rational called the rational recovery Every, system mm -hmm. is certainly not anti-religious but what it is is said there are other ways to approach this matter of, of alcoholism mm -hmm. but when you talk about dependence and uh, god was a drug or, or or god was a what a roach or god was a uh, you know a bottle of alcohol or whatever mm -hmm. I mean, god god various things become our god really what we're talking about uh, in psychological terms is that uh, there are some people who simply tend to be dependent and they're going yeah. to be dependent on, on something. something and if we were to get today and I don't think we'll get there on on a discussion of authoritarianism and its very special relationship to to fundamentalism mm -hmm. and why those two things mate nicely together what you're going to find in an authoritarian is this very dependent personality. Oh, of, that's interesting. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, a, 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 an extreme reverence for authority, all authority. Hmm. Sure. Well, um, oh gosh, something just flitted into my mind and flitted right back out again, uh, having to do with, um, with uh, dependence. And, uh, oh, I know what it was. It's they always have to exchange one for another, don't they? I mean, often. I shouldn't say always. Well, that that happens with a lot of people. If 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 you don't uh, if you don't help them to realize the the, mm -hmm. the fact that they are dependent. In other words, a hero a, a heroin user uh, might then become a voracious eater. Yeah. You know, uh -huh. and, and now instead of being on cloud nine, uh, you know, yeah. giving himself heroin intravenously or something like that, he'll now be eating so much that he'll be as white as he is tall and he'll be rolling down. I mean, it, you go from one dependency yeah. to the other. You never solve the basic problem, which is why is there this great need to be dependent on something for pleasure, to feel mm -hmm. normal, to feel acceptable or whatever it is that you're looking for. Well, my husband, I think, was the one that told me he was invited to a um, um, 12-step program thing, alcoholism bit, and he said he nearly died before he got out of there because the smoke, they smoke incessantly and they were drinking coffee. They never, they always have to have something going, something in their hands. There seems to be a, a terrible need for that as well as this craving, whatever it, mm -hmm. it might be. Uh, but there's nothing to really, if you're, that, that is something that's just inborn, uh, the addict, the addictive uh, personality, or 
Well, uh, know you know, we do a lot of research on why people become addicted to things, and we have, we believe, for instance, that people that become, most people who become addicted to alcohol have an inherited tendency to tolerate alcohol better, mm -hmm. which means that they can get higher levels of it in their blood mm -hmm. before they actually feel the effects. Mm -hmm. that, that most of us would feel, let's say, two or three or four drinks. And that, that, that allows them to, to be getting accustomed to having high levels of alcohol in their blood before, and, and thus become addicted before they realize what's happening. Uh -huh. In other words, the suggestion here is that one doesn't necessarily become alcoholic out of some deep psychological yes, need. Right. They may it's just start physical. drinking innocently, and it's a physical thing. Yeah. And... Uh, but but that's just one viewpoint, and there's there's only so much support for that, uh, mm -hmm. that viewpoint. One one thing I I think I, sh I should point out when it comes to belief in God or mm -hmm. not belief in God, and why we become dependent on a God or whatever is that these these beliefs you know whatever our needs are whatever impels us to believe or not to believe are usually so strong and so passionate that it takes almost no basis whatsoever for us to believe, mm -hmm. and it takes almost no continuing reinforcement of that belief for us to keep it. Uh -huh. That, as a matter of fact, that once we decide to believe in something that, that impassions us, that mm -hmm. we have a great need for, that <clears throat> we, number one, reject out of hand any argument or any yes. kind of information which goes against, counter to our belief. We accept unquestioningly any kind of information which is supportive of our belief, regardless of where it comes from. Uh, we make things called illusory correlations uh, between what goes on in life and maybe certain behaviors that we engage in that are related to this belief mm -hmm. that, that cause us to these beliefs to persevere or persist. For instance, let, let, let's take the farmer and the almanac. Oh, yes. The farmer and the almanac. I mean, some farmers are dedicated to the use of the almanac, and they plant their crops according, according to, the to the almanac, and say that in 20 years, this dedicated farmer, this man who passionately believes in the use of the almanac as a, as a basis for planting crops, has had one bumper crop that he can attribute. Oh, I, I mean, realistically speaking, to that. That one year of success mm -hmm. is sufficient for, for, for this to belief on? to persevere. That's correct. Isn't that you amazing? Well, sure, but, 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 but let me tell you, that doesn't just apply to the farmer's almanac, nor does no. that apply to Christians who believe in God. That applies to atheists who don't believe. That applies yeah. to any of us who have a belief for which there is a great need. Yeah. Well, <laughs> in, in which we I'd, give up, I'd give up being an atheist if there's somebody to take care of me and give me eternal life, but I just haven't seen anything that well, looks you see, now, promising. That, see, that's an interesting thing, because if, if you're an atheist, you will want a rational, a demonstrable yeah, con cause-effect connection, for instance, between I prayed today and I got precisely yeah, what I wanted. And Ron, can you believe we have to wind this up, but quick, and but you'll quick. come back. You've and got I, to come yes. back. Wonderful. Well, yeah. it's goodbye for now from Pre-Thought Forum. I think as I please and this gives me pleasure My conscience decrees This right I must treasure My thoughts will not cater To duke or dictator No person can deny Dig a dog and sin fry No person can deny Dig a dog and sin fry
should tyrants take me and throw me in prison, my thoughts will burn.